Bible, you'll read this phrase, from Dan to Beersheba. What that means, the, more, the farther, uh, farthest northernmost city down to the farthest southernmost city, Dan and Beersheba. It was a way of speaking of all of Israel, you would say, from Dan down to Beersheba. And so um, the first time Dan is mentioned in the Bible, I'm going to kind of talk to you about the lower part of the city that we walked through earlier. And then I'm going to talk to you about this place where we're at right now and maybe some of the significance of where you're sitting even. Uh, the first time Dan's mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham and his uh, nephew Lot, who is kind of a bonehead, you might remember, uh, they uh, were together, but they decided, man, we have so many flocks and herds, we just don't fit together, it's hard to keep them separate, there's a lot, you know, basically this, uh, there's too many, uh, you know, this town isn't big enough for the both of us type of thing. And he said, uh, Abraham said, you know what, Lot, uh, we need to split up. I'm going to let you choose. You choose which way you want to go. I'll take the other way, right? And so it says that Lot looked to the east. He saw the plains of the Jordan, which were very fertile and good for, you know, feeding animals and planting crops. And so he took that good land down to the east towards the Jordan Valley. Of course, that being further south from here. Uh, and then Abraham said, okay, cool. I'll go the other direction. I'll go to the west. And uh, But what happened is that uh, Lot didn't just move into the Jordan Valley, but he moved into one of the big cities down there, which was the city of Sodom, which you might have heard of. It has kind of a bad reputation, right? So he moved uh, closer and closer to Sodom. We get the impression that it was kind of a progressive move. He moved, you know, he set his tents towards Sodom. Then he moved a little bit closer to Sodom. Then he moved into Sodom. And finally, we see him in the gates of the city. Now, we've seen some of these gates. We know that happens there. That's where the elders of the city would sit. They would pronounce judgments. They would work, you know, kind of dealing with the people in the city. The point being that he became a, a, a leader in the city of Sodom, very integrated into the city. And, uh, and what that means is that Lot got more and more involved in the city. And it tells us in the Bible that, uh, that Sodom was an exceedingly wicked city, right? So he gets more and more involved in this exceedingly wicked city. And really what we have with Lot, to put it in our terms that we use today, he's an example of what we would call a carnal believer, right? Like he believes the stuff but he doesn't really walk the walk. He walks and lives just as someone would who doesn't really believe in God. You know, kind of uh, one foot in, one foot out, kind of lukewarm, we might say. And I, and I tend to believe that the lukewarm person, the person who's living half in the world and half uh, with God, is really the most miserable person in the, on the world because they're neither fish nor fowl, right? They're, they're a fish out of water. They're, they're uncomfortable here and they're uncomfortable there. They're kind of ne neither this nor that. And so Lot um, is also an example of how our actions have consequences. And so Lot suffered a lot of the negative consequences of his decisions. And, and more than just Lot suffering, his family suffered the consequences of Lot's decisions. Uh, in Genesis 14, here's what kind of happens. Because Lot has moved into Sodom, there was a kind of tribal war with all these different tribal uh, you know, city-states and the kings and lords of those towns started fighting against each other. Lot kind of got caught up in the midst of that because he was so integrated in Sodom. <coughs> Excuse me. And he, um, he ends up getting taken captive and brought to this city where we were just at, Laish, right? The city of later renamed Dan. So he gets brought here to this place. And so Abraham... Here's word that his nephew Lot was in Sodom. Sodom got attacked. He got taken captive. He's like a prisoner of war. Got brought up here to this region in the very extreme north to the region of Dan. And so Abraham gathered, you know, he's kind of like a rancher. He's got a lot of people who work for him. It says that he got the 318 men who worked for him. And as a, they formed kind of like a small army, you might say. <coughs> Excuse me. And they came up here to Dan and they rescued Lot out of this city. Um, but where did Lot go after that? Well, where else? He went right back to Sodom because why not, right? It's uh, worked out well so far, so he went right back there. Uh, that carnal lifestyle, back to that, back to the carnal lifestyle, back to the carnal decisions, and there were even more negative consequences. You might know the story. Pillar of salt, right? Daughters doing this and that. Nothing, nothing good. And, uh, and here in Tel Dan, there's a gate that we're going to see. It's going to be that way as we leave this park in just a minute. And it's called the Abraham Gate. And it dates all the way back to about 1800 B.C. B.C., before Christ, 1800 B.C. This is a gate that Abraham would have walked through 
uh, and we're going to see that in a short time here. Uh, it's a place where Abraham would have come when he, when he came here to rescue Lot. Again, let me just say this one last thing about Lot. You know what's so incredible about Lot? Like, we read about him, we're like, wow, that guy was kind of a bonehead, very carnal, made a lot of really bad decisions, messed up his family, messed up his own life. Uh, but when the New Testament talks about him in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, what does it call him? It calls him righteous Lot. Now, if I was going to find an adjective to describe Lot, which I've already used some, you might have noticed, uh, I, that's not the one I would have chosen. But apparently when God looked at Lot, that's how he describes him. He says, I look at Lot, and you know what Lot's like? He's a righteous dude. And that's surprising, right? Because uh, it's surprising that God would look at someone who made a lot of bad decisions and did a lot of things which God probably was, was grieved by, and yet God looks at him and says, he's a righteous man. And that gives me a lot of hope, and I, it should give you a lot of hope as well. Because obviously Lot wasn't righteous according to his own actions, but he was declared righteous, he was deemed righteous, he was accounted righteous by God on the basis of, of his faith in God. And, and really, that's the message of the gospel for you and me. Do you realize that? Based on your actions, you are not righteous. That's not the adjective we would use to describe you. But God, because he is rich in mercy, by grace, he declares you righteous in Christ because of your faith in who Jesus is and what Jesus did for you. When God looks at you, he doesn't think about the messed up things that you've done. He sees you in Christ justified and righteous. And Lot encourages us in that way. Now in the book of Judges chapter 18, we read another thing about the city of Dan. The tribe of Dan, right? They are the ones who came and settled this area. Well, actually, the tribe of Dan originally was given an allotment of land, not in this area, but in the area around Tel Aviv, where we were before. However, you know, in that time, right, there were Canaanites in the area, and their job, each of these tribes, was to go into those areas, and drive out the Canaanites, and settle those areas. Well, the tribe of Dan was unable to do that. They were unable to drive out um, the Canaanites from that area, and so they petitioned, and they asked, hey, could we maybe be given a different lot of land, because this one's too hard for us. And so um, they were uh, kind of given permission to come up to this area. It's an interesting story. I'll summarize it for you. What happened is they wanted to come up to a different area. They heard about this city, Laish, which was a Canaanite city. So what they did is they, they uh, paid off, a, they had a corrupt priest who they kind of talked into saying, yeah, God said that now that's not your land in Tel Aviv. Now this is your land way up far north. And then they went back, told the people, oh, well, hey, the priest said that God said this. So they brought all the people up here and they sacked the city. And guess who they also killed? They also killed that corrupt priest who they had paid off to give this uh, word that they were to move up here. Anyway, they move up here to Laish. They rename the city Dan and, uh, and they come up here. But perhaps what's most significant about this city, as we are here right now in this spot, uh, the city of Dan is most famous in the Bible as a place of idol worship. Uh, during the time of King David and King Solomon, right? The first three kings of Israel. King Saul, we read about them in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and then into 1 Kings. The first three kings of Israel, King Saul, then King David, and then King Solomon. And during the time of Saul, David, and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was a united kingdom. One united nation. All the tribes were under one kingdom. But in the time after Solomon, his son was named Rehoboam. Rehoboam was not as wise as his father Solomon. Uh, in fact, he was a very weak leader. And if you read the story, what happened is that he, uh, he took bad advice and he became a very harsh leader. He was very kind of cruel and harsh with the people. And what happened is that during that time, Jeroboam, who was the son of one of Solomon's officials, kind of rose up during that time and he led the people away, he led a rebellion against Rehoboam, who was the rightful king, but he led a rebellion and said, you know what, you know, Rehoboam's a, a bad leader, come and follow me. What happened during that time? The 10 northern tribes in this area where we're at, which became a new kingdom, the kingdom split into two, the country split into two kingdoms. In the north, the kingdom of Israel, encompassing the 10 northern tribes. In the south, two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, that became known as the kingdom of Judah. And it was that way until the Babylonian exile. Um, the, the northern kingdom was originally much more prosperous than the southern kingdom. You can see that this is not, uh, 
this is a lush, you know, fertile land that we're in. It's very green, especially this time of year. And uh, the northern kingdom got to have this, the best land, whereas the southern kingdom was left with the desert where there's very few things that you could do agriculturally. Uh, the northern kingdom was also, though, uh, from the start, characterized by idolatry. Jeroboam himself, the one who led the break in the kingdom, the one who became the king of the northern kingdom, he himself led the people into idolatry. And you remember we read about King Ahab just a couple days ago on Mount Carmel. Well, that happened after Jeroboam. I mean, they had a history in the north of idol worship. And it all kind of, one of the main places it began was here in the city of Dan. Uh, Jeroboam encouraged idol worship. And the reason he encouraged it was because he wanted to cut ties with Jerusalem. It was a political move. He did not want the people going down to Jerusalem. Uh, but of course, the temple was located in Jerusalem. So people from the northern tribes still wanted to go down to Jerusalem and keep those festivals, which they were supposed to keep according to the law. But then uh, Jeroboam realized, and he actually says this. Here, here's what he says in, in 1 Kings chapter 2. He realizes that this is a problem. The people are going to want to go down to Jerusalem. They're going to want to make sacrifices in the temple. And he's afraid that if that happens, he'll lose the allegiance of the people. They'll turn back to Rehoboam. And so here's what he says in 1 Kings chapter 12. He says, Jeroboam said to himself, <coughs> Excuse me. Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David because this people will go up to the temple at Jerusalem and the hearts of the people will turn back to the Lord and to Rehoboam their king and they will kill me and they will return to Rehoboam as their king. So here's what he did. He came up with a plan. Jeroboam made two calves of gold and he said to the people, you've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Now, I just want to stop there and point out the uh, irony. Do you remember that there was a time when they made a golden calf? Right? That was after God brought them out of Egypt. There's a huge irony here. He brings up this golden calf and he's, he puts one in Dan and he put the other one in Bethel. But there's a huge irony there. He puts this golden calf and he tries to change history and say, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. It says he set one in Bethel, south of here, and the other one he put in Dan. And it says this thing became a sin for the people. They went as far as Dan to, before, to be before one of these calves. It goes on in uh, verse 31 of chapter 12. Jeroboam also built pagan temples and high places and appointed priests from among the people who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, just like the feast that was in Judah. And he offered sacrifices on the altar, and he instituted a feast for the people of Israel, and went up to the altar to make sacrifices. When Jeroboam wanted to turn the people away from the true and living God, he created a counterfeit. So many times that's the enemy's modus operandi, right? His M.O. He creates a counterfeit, a fake, a replacement, something to keep the people from worshiping the true and living God. And, and what's sad is that this whole thing was politically motivated. Uh, Jeroboam led the people into idolatry purely for selfish interest because he believed that it would help him remain in power. And one of the things I've often marveled at is how quickly and easily the people embraced idolatry. In fact, that's been one of the questions that several of you have asked me so far on this trip, and I want to answer it right now. Why were the people so attracted to idol worship? Why were they so quick to turn away from God and worship idols? Before I get answer that question, let me just say this. The seats you're sitting on right now are the seats where people would have sat 3,000 years ago, let's say, and they would have watched sacrifices here. Right over here? Let me show you this. These are stairs. These are stairs that the priest himself, pagan priest, would have walked up these stairs, maybe gone even higher, and made a sacrifice right here on this giant altar. This right here is the foundation of the altar. It would have been built up to this height, and sacrifices would have been made here. But this is what it looked like. You know, in our Western society, I think most people nowadays, they don't bow down to uh, statues. Uh, and worship idols. But yet, as you probably know, idolatry is is alive and well in Western society even today. Many of us, like the people of Israel, we're very prone and susceptible to idolatry, and we easily succumb to it just like they did, even if we don't use fire and blood and altars and things like this. Uh, see, idolatry, an idol, isn't just a, a statue. 
that you worship. An idol is anything you worship other than God. It's anything that you look to to give you that which only God can give you. Right? There are things which only God can give you, and when you look to something other than God to give you that, that is a false God, a a counterfeit God, an idol. In our society, we tend to make idols out of things like money, uh, family, health, uh, recreation, success. We make an idol out of something it, usually an idol is, is usually a good thing that we take and we turn it into the ultimate thing in our lives and in our hearts. Uh, in ancient times, idols always represented something, right? An idol represented the gods of, there were gods for power, gods of success, gods of sexual allure and attraction, gods of fertility, gods of physical uh, allure again and, and these kind of things. We worship those same things today. Idolatry is alive and well in our society. So again, let me ask you this. What was the attraction? Like, why would the people continually turn away from the true God and continually turn to these idols? Here's why. See, idols give you an illusion of control. They give you an illusion that you are in control. See, an idol, the way it worked, is it's kind of like a vending machine. You put in the money, you push the button, and you get what you want. Right? With the idol, you go to the idol, you make the sacrifice, and it gives you what you want. In other words, there's a semblance, there's an illusion that you are in control, that you can manipulate the deity, right? And you need a God to give you the boost that you need to get what you want out of life. And so the, uh, the illusion with idols is, and false gods is that you can control them, you can manipulate them to give you what you really want in life, whatever that is. Whereas with the true and living God, with Yahweh, the Bible literally says this, right? I think it's Psalm 87. It says, Yahweh, God is in heaven, and he does whatever he wants, right? Like, uh, he's a free-range God. He thinks for himself. You cannot control him. You can get on board with what he's doing, but you cannot dictate to him what to do, and you cannot control him, and you cannot manipulate him. And of course, there are a lot of people who don't like that. They would prefer to have a God who they can control. Put in the money in the vending machine, push the button, get what you want. That's what we want so many times in life. But again, with idols, let me just emphasize this. There is only an illusion. There's only a semblance. There's only a a false illusion that you are in control, that you have, that you can manipulate it. It's all just a promise. It's a carrot on a stick in front of your nose, keeping you going. It never actually gives you that thing that it promises you. And that's true of the idols in our lives as well. How many times have you heard someone say something like this? Well, if God doesn't give me this thing, if God doesn't come through on this thing that I'm praying for, if God doesn't give me this thing that I want, well, then I'm done. I'm done being a Christian. I'm done with this whole Christianity thing. I'll just walk away from the whole thing. If God doesn't give me a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, then what's the point of being a Christian anyway? Right? If God doesn't heal me from this affliction that I have, then what good is God to me if he doesn't do that for me? Let me ask you a very fundamental question. If you don't remember anything else from what I'm saying, please remember this. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do you worship God because he is useful to you? Or do you worship God because he is beautiful to you? Let me ask you again. Do you view God primarily as useful to you? Or do you see him as beautiful to you? What is your motivation in worshiping him? Is it because you see him as useful or because you see him as beautiful? Let me tell you, friends, those two things lead to two very different ways of living, worshiping, thinking. They're very, very different in, in, in what they produce in our lives. Here's why. If you see God primarily as useful to you, then what about when he isn't? Because he's not always going to give you what you want. Okay? He, he's, what about when he doesn't uh, answer that prayer with a yes? What if he answers it with a no? What if he doesn't give you the thing that you want? What if he he has a different plan than the plan that you have for your life? If you see God as useful to you, right? You call him the big guy upstairs who can kind of pull some strings, make some stuff happen for you down here on earth. Um, Then let me explain this. You are still focused on yourself. You are still focused on yourself. You're not worshiping God for who he is. You're worshiping God because you think he is useful to help you accomplish your plans and reach your goals. On the other hand, if you see God as beautiful and you worship him because of who he is, not because of what he can do for you, then not only will you worship him when you get what you want or in order to get what you want, 
but you worship him for who he is. And in that case, no matter what the circumstances of your life, no matter what difficulties might come into your life, you are dedicated to him for who he is and not just what for he not just for what he can do for you. Idolatry is all about finding a god who you consider useful to you. But when you worship the real god because he is beautiful, you will not accept any counterfeit, never. The worship of idols here in the northern kingdom of Israel, it, it eventually led them to being taken captive by the Assyrians. But even in that, here's the good news, guys. God did not forsake his people. A remnant remained of those who did not bow the knee to the idols. And may that be true of us. May we be those who never bow our knee to the idols. May we see idolatry for what it is. May we see God for who he is. And may we worship him, not because we consider him useful, but because we consider him beautiful. Amen? Amen.